those of you who I haven't met yet, my name is Kirk, I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, it's, it's been a while since I've been up here, so it's good to be back. Um, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, for, for the few of you who may not know, I've, you know, I've been recovering from a, a health issue. Back in the middle of December, I had uh, surgery to have a tumor that was pressing into my brain and my optical nerve removed. Um, it was causing some vision loss for me. I uh, went in the span of six months, I went from uh, noticing a slight vision change in my right eye to having 90% vision loss in my right eye. And in my left eye, I had about 30, 25 to 30% vision loss. I can, I'm happy to say that now, after the incredibly successful surgery, thank you so much for your prayers. I mean, they were felt, they were received. God moved as a result of your prayers, so thank you so much. Uh, I'm happy to say that I can see now. <laughs> I uh, have, yeah, yeah, it's an incredible report. You know, God's hand was in every single step of this entire process, and that's a whole long story that maybe I'll share with you one day. We don't have time for it this morning, but I really wanted to talk about this because I wanted to say thank you. I mean, y'all's love and support was so well felt and received, and I'll, I'll say that uh, Melissa and I were grateful for those of you who signed up to bring us meals. We had over a week's worth of meals, and thank the Lord for leftovers. I think we were set for a couple of weeks for sure, and it's just so great to be a part of a church family who really cares and really uh, shows it, right? And so just thank you. Yeah. So um, today, as Kim uh, mentioned, we are beginning a series uh, that is called Magnifying Marriage. Magnifying Marriage. And it's a four-week series. And the first two weeks, you're going to be with me. And then in the third week, we have a guest speaker coming. Uh, his name is Stan Davis. He's a phenomenal teacher, preacher. He's going to talk about all things uh, marriage, but that's not the only subject that he's limited to. We didn't limit him at all. And so we're going to hear what the Lord has to say through him. An important note, and in case maybe you weren't in here for the announcements or whatever, we have just the day before that third week of the series, we're having a date night, okay? And so if you're married, have a boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, a fiance, y'all get registered for that. It's $20 a person, which adds to about 40 bucks out of your pocket, all right? So go ahead and do that. Get, get, go ahead and come. We're going to have a great time. It's going to be right here at the church. We're going to be in the sanctuary having dinner, and I'm excited to see what God want, wants to do there. Finally, the fourth week, we're doing something a little different, a little unique. We're going to have a, a panel. You know, back in, on Father's Day, we had several people come up here and kind of share their own experience from the perspective of fatherhood. We're going to do that with marriage now. We're going to have three couples and a moderator that's asking them practical questions and see uh, their perspective on how they approach different things that come up in life. I think it's going to be a great time. I'm excited to see what God wants to do in that fourth and final week. All right. Well, before we get into the subject of marriage, which is a vital subject, of course, that every church should be, uh, you know, happy to teach on and preach on and to reinforce. And, uh, but before we get into that, I, I want to say that, uh, you know, I want to speak to the singles for a minute here because you might feel a little left out. And I don't want you to feel left out. Um, I do want to speak to you here and now. You know, I think that uh, for the most part, and most churches, uh, maybe even our church included, don't do a very good job at speaking to where you are in this season of your life. You know, some singles may feel as though church leadership sees your time as almost kind of held in suspension until God brings the right person along and then you can kind of, you know, start your life. And if you feel that way, I hope that you don't because we don't see it that way. We, we don't, this church doesn't see it this, that way. I don't see it that way. I see that the, the singles in the hands of a loving God have more availability to God than, than married people ever even hope or dream of. There's a, there's a, there's a you know, singles in the hands of, of the Lord is like a precision instrument that God can do a lot with so long as singles are doing single life God's way. And so I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, there's this, huge potential risk for singles to feel like they're not where they need to be, to feel like, well, I'm not measuring up to other people. And that's the sin of comparison. 
We don't need to do that. There's no, there's no reason to do that. And I want to build a small case for that before we get into our material for today. I believe that God has you right where you are for a purpose. And God doesn't see that kind of same negativity that you might see in your life of comparison if you're stuck in that endless loop. I want to point out that Paul emphasizes singleness in Scripture. He he emphasizes it almost as like a means for spiritual pursuit. And he only gives a a concession for those who want to be married. I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about in the Scripture in the New Testament. That he only gives concession for those that want to be married. Life done, single life done God's way, in my opinion, is kind of spiritual superpower in some sense. It's the opportunity for laser-like focus on, the king, on kingdom business. It's a badge of honor. It's something that is worthy of admiration. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you're divorced. And I want to borrow a point from last week from Miss Mandy Collette. Nothing is wasted. So long as your whole life, wounds, past mistakes, problems are entirely given to the Father, nothing is wasted. Even your emotional exhaustion as a result of going through a divorce or maybe even you know, all the heartache that goes into that and all the pain that comes with that, nothing is wasted. The life of a single and the hands of a determined king is a powerful thing. Jesus was single. Eleven out of the twelve disciples were single. Paul, the apostle, although early in life he was likely engaged to be married, I believe that, well, I believe that he was engaged before the Damascus Road experience. And then after he received Jesus, he went back home and was rejected by his soon-to-be in-laws. I don't have, you know, that's what I believe that the evidence supports that idea. I don't know for sure if that's true. What I do know for sure is that Paul did his entire ministry career as a single. The biblical activity and traction that we see in the New Testament is almost entirely done by singles. You are valuable. We see you. We love you. You matter. God's got big things for you. This season, however long it may be, is a powerful thing. Embrace it. Run with it. Furthermore, I want to finish this section by talking about the fact that going into the subject of, you know, depth Uh, And marriage can be a sore subject for some. I may touch on issues that still hurt for some of you. And if I talk about something that makes you feel frustrated or makes you feel maybe remorseful that you wish you could have done things a little bit differently or you wish that things wouldn't have played out the way that they did or maybe you even say something that offends you. If that happens, I want to ask you to do two things. First, I want to ask you for the benefit of the doubt for me, okay? I'm not up here trying to make you feel bad or to touch on sore subjects in your life or make you feel less than in any way whatsoever. I'm here to preach and to teach marriage done God's way, and it's something that I happen to believe in in a big way. I believe that if you do marriage God's way, it actually leads to successful, happy, healthy marriages. And if I didn't believe that, I have no business being up here to begin with. So give me the benefit of the doubt. I I hope you'll do that. And the second thing I want to ask you to do is not to suppress those feelings. If there is friction created in you by the, you know, the conversation of marriage done God's way, I want to suggest to you that might be a misalignment in your life that the Holy Spirit wants to bring uh, correction to. That friction is actually a good thing because it's pointing out something that needs to be healed. And for you, that might be the biggest thing that you take out of this series. So if it hurts, if it stings, take notes. Go to the Lord in your quiet place. Let him heal it. Amen. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. It's not going to take you very long. It's right in the very beginning. Genesis chapter 2. And as you do, 
this can't be a marriage series unless I, you know, introduce you to my family. So let me go ahead and show you the picture uh, that we have for my family. Um, there's my wife, Melissa Kaufman, of 17 years now. We've been married. It goes by so fast. It seems like yesterday that we got married, but um, incredible woman. If you don't know her, you should get to know her. She's awesome. Um, holding her hand is my firstborn and my daughter, Abigail. She is soon to be 15 and soon to be learning how to drive. Y'all pray for me. I'm going to be teaching her how to drive. She's not in here right now, but I need some patience. Um, holding her hand is my firstborn son, Luke. Uh, he is 12 years old. He's into guitar and soccer and video games. Let's be real. I can't just, that's the main thing that he's into. He likes video games. I like to think that it's guitar and soccer, but he's actually into video games. I, I, I don't know. And then Elijah is next to him, and he is eight years old, and he is a ball of energy, and he likes everything that he sees, uh, including all of the things that I listed before. He's, he, he also does soccer, and he's learned how to play drums. So, and I should mention that Abby is, loves worship, and she loves to sing, and that she is learning how to play piano. So that's my family. Um, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God used a, a cause, the deep sleep, to fall on Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And then the rib, which the Lord God had taken out of man, he made into woman. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, and, uh, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. You know, in case you didn't see it here in this short paragraph in the second chapter of the opening book of the Bible, we get a comprehensive definition of what marriage is. In one short passage, we have two clearly defined genders, one man and one woman entering into marriage, and we even get a glimpse into why God created it. And Eve was a helpmeet. They were meant to help each other. That was a, that's a glimpse. It's not the full story of why God created, but it's a real glimpse into why God created marriage. They're supposed to help each other accomplish what God put them on the earth to do. It seems to me like each generation, as far as more recent history, has tried and ultimately failed to redefine what marriage is. You know, the boomers have the segment of their generation called the hippies that went about doing the free love movement in an effort to do away with the institution of marriage, at least the definition as the, you know, to the traditional construct. And they did this by trying to shirk the rigid defini definition and cherry-pick what they thought were the best parts of marriage and throw out what they thought were the worst parts, like commitment and covenant and, you know, being dedicated to one person for the rest of your life. They just wanted the fun parts. But ultimately, it was a fad, and it didn't last um, those hippies, those very same hippies in huge sweeping numbers ended up married anyways with, yes, the traditional construct of what we believe marriage to be between, or at least the very basic idea of it. They attempted to rewrite the laws of marriage and didn't have much to show for it except for a ring on their finger, some deep-rooted dysfunctions to overcome, and no doubt in some cases more than a few diseases to deal with. That was supposed to be funny. Sorry, that didn't come off. <laughs> I don't mean to just pick on the hippies, okay? 
Each generation seems to have their their own go at bumping it up against the institution of marriage. Yesterday's generation says, well, it doesn't really have to be between one man and one woman. It can be between man and man or woman and woman. Today's generation can't even really seem to agree on what a man and a woman even is to begin with. So they've got, we've got our own problems, don't we? But rest assured, church, I've said all that to say this. Marriage, as God has defined it, is alive and well today. The truth is, is that all across the country, all across the continent, and even the world, the definition of marriage is doing just fine. People from every culture, every language, every ethnicity, even every every religion, all have marriage between one man and one woman as the predominant expression of what marriage is. Every other definition can be at best categorized as the fringe minority, Marriage defined by God is, well, marriage as defined by God is a, is a juggernaut of self-revealing truth. Those who come up against it do so at their own risk. Okay, so let me just say that just because the, the definition of marriage is alive and well today, just because it seems to be, you know, written in the heavens on how marriage should go and all people across the world can kind of figure that out because it's a bit of a self-revealing truth, doesn't mean that marriage is, inherent, is, is easy. As a matter of fact, marriage is inherently difficult. And you might be thinking, well, why is that? If God has created it, why does it have to be so hard? And the answer to that question is really pretty simple. God created marriage before the fall. So it was initially and t- probably going to be a lot easier than what we find it to be today. And so the answer is quite simple. Marriage is inherently difficult because mankind is inherently sinful. The degree to which marriage, sorry, excuse me, the degree to which sin is present in the individuals who make up the marriage is the degree of difficulty to which that marriage will face. It's as simple as that. The devil and the trappings of sin and selfishness are the chief enemy to man and wife, and it's been that way since the very first marriage. The opposite of that is true. Also, the degree to which we accept, adopt, and practice marriage done God's way is the degree to which we can avoid those very same trappings and and experience a happy, healthy, life-giving, purpose-filled marriage that stands the test of time. And as we move into the sort of the meat or the main subject for today's message, I want to begin by providing a loose definition or, or maybe a better way to say it is a, is a mindset that I have when it comes to the subject of marriage. I believe that marriage is about two people taking responsibility for each other and, do, and, and doing that by overcoming sin as a team by means and to, by using the tools of Love, mercy, and grace, with the expressed purpose of becoming one flesh and carrying out God's vision for their united lives. This goal will only ever be achieved by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in that journey, we will learn about the character and values of God from a unique perspective. And we'll catch a glimpse into his and into the, the Lord Jesus' passionate love for the church. The title of today's message is Magnifying the Law of Priority in Marriage. Magnifying the Law of Priority in Marriage. You know, we read a whole passage from Genesis chapter 2, but we read all that so that I could point out nine words. I believe that the law of priority is found in these nine words of that passage. In verse 24, it says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother. Stop. These nine words have a lot to say about this idea concerning the law of priority. And we can see through these words that up to this point, The most important relationship in any person's life is the relationship between a child and parents, mother and father. 
And I know that this sentence is from the perspective of a man, but it applies also to a woman. A child to parents is the most important relationship. That is assumed. That is taken for granted from the perspective of Scripture. That much we know. The fifth commandment says to honor your father and mother. And children should be dedicated and loyal to their parents and put that relationship as first priority in their lives outside of their relationship with God. Now, I know that we live in a lost and broken world and that the way that God intended for the in design life to go doesn't always play out that way because sometimes there are parents that are undeserving of that position of priority in life. Sometimes parents disqualify themselves from being in that spot. Sometimes there's wounds that are created from the result of sin and brokenness in a home. Or the, I get that things don't always go that way. And while we're here talking about it, I just want to say that one of the chief reasons that Jesus came to the earth, one of his express purposes was to come and heal the brokenhearted and to set the captive free. If you are trapped in this cyclical pattern of frustration and anger and unforgiveness towards your earthly parents, I want to say that Jesus has come to set you free from that. He's, he's come to heal your broken heart. And I get that there, there may not ever be a relationship that ever exists between you and your parents that would fit this description that I'm trying to, to say. That that priority, that that level of trust may never be there because there's not two willing participants that are subject to the lordship of Christ. But where there are two people subject to the lordship of Christ, every kind of, of, of restoration is possible with God. There is no relationship that is too far gone that God can't bring it back so long as they will submit their, their own willful desires to his lordship. And so I think that there, there is this, there's not the expectation that every single uh, broken homed issue, like a situation where there's a, the individual who, who feels um, as though um, they're, they're frustrated with parents or they think that, that that relationship can't be healed. What I, what I will say, the expectation isn't for the priority and trust to come back. There is an expectation of the Christian, though. The expectation at the minimum for the Christian is forgiveness. We must forgive our parents regardless of the turmoil that existed. And I know that that's a difficult thing for a lot of people to even consider. But let me break that down just a little bit. Forgiveness and complete restoration and trust are not the same thing. That's not the ask. The ask is to not hold past sins against your parents where your heart and where, where anger in your heart can win the day. The ask is for you to have a new set of grace and mercy for them every day, just like God has a new set of mercy and grace for you every day. That is the ask. And, and, and the benefit is that there is freedom and forgiveness. Holding on to past hurts and pains keeps you in a jail cell of anger and unforgiveness. It creates a pattern of dysfunction that flows down the line of, of legacy, flows down the line of family ties. And maybe, most importantly, it arrests the development of what God wants to do in your heart. It is a full stop on what he is trying to do in your life. We must forgive. That's the expectation. So coming back to Genesis 24, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. We've already established that the father-mother relationship in the life of a young person, a single or whatever, is the most important relationship. And we see that this is the reason that they leave. They leave. So this is the most important, and marriage is the reason that they leave. So we have this sort of uh, 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 transfer of priority that happens. And that suggests something else. It suggests that everything and anything that exists in life and that you may encounter in life should not ever be put above 
your spousal relationship. There's a wider principle, and it extends beyond the prioritization of spouse over parents. It's, it's this principle that you can't and shouldn't prioritize anything or anyone above your spouse, outside your relationship with God, of course. I'll always have that caveat. And God has designed us to be social beings, meaning that we're going to encounter hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of people and, 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 and have all these different relationships. And we're going to have a varied experience with each one of these thousands of people that we're going to encounter. And because of that variety, there is naturally going to be a sliding scale of loyalty and depth in each one of those relationships. As odd as it sounds, though, we don't just have relationships with people. We have relationships with things and, like, activities. I'll really quickly prove it to you. A lot of people have an unhealthy relationship with their cell phone. Um, a lot of people uh, have... Uh, unhealthy relationship with sports. Like there's, we have relationships with things other than people. On the positive side of things, every Christian should have a type of relationship with the local church. Like we, we encounter relationships that are outside of just a person to person relationship. And look, be, l- let me just point this out. Everyone and everything cannot be equally important to you. We bump up against our capacity as human beings. We can't do that. Only God is infinite. We are finite. And because of our our finitude, we can't accept everything equally. So as a result of necessity, there's a sliding scale of priority. You have a list of priorities on who is most important to you. It's a matter of fact. You may not realize that that's true, but it is absolutely true. There is a list of priorities. And what I want to say to you today is that God has something he wants to say about that list. Whether you've defined it, whether you've detailed it or not, he has something he wants to say about it. It's it's extremely important that we get that right, especially for married couples. So The main idea for today's talk is that You need to get your marriage in its proper place according to God's way for your priority list. You know, this idea, it seems like such a simple concept, and it is. It's so simple. It is, after all, a foundational law of marriage. It's pretty self-evident, but you would be shocked at how many couples get it wrong. Life has an uncanny ability to disrupt the law of priority. And there are two key indicators that point out a violation of that law of priority. The first one deals with the subject of legitimate jealousy. If one or both of you have a a, a claim to legitimate jealousy, it's an indicator that the law of priority has been violated. I'm going to break that down for you a little bit. The idea of jealousy being something that is legitimate might come as a surprise to you. You may, after all, be thinking, well, isn't jealousy a sin? And the answer to that is, yes, in some expressions, jealousy is a sin, is a sin especially if, it's, you know, if it presents itself as covetousness, which is basically the idea that you want something that doesn't belong to you, that belongs to somebody else. That's covetousness. That brings about jealousy in a negative way. There is, however, the other side of that same coin where there's legitimate jealousy, where someone has given something away that does, in fact, legitimately belong to you. That is legitimate jealousy. We see this jealousy expressed in God. And God calls himself a jealous God. He says that one of his names means jealous. And so legitimate jealousy is a thing. And it can rise up. And when your spouse has given your position of priority to someone or something else, you have every right to be jealous. But just because you have the right to be jealous doesn't mean that doesn't also come with a responsibility. This is where the other shoe needs to drop, but often doesn't. 
When you experience legitimate jealousy, you have a responsibility to confront that behavior that has brought the jealousy on. You have to go to him or her and have an adult conversation about what's going on in your heart. Oftentimes, your spouse doesn't even know that they have deprioritized you. Life has a way of making that which is unimportant, urgent. I'm going to say that again. Life has a way of say, making that which is unimportant, urgent. And that urgency has the tendency to make us deprioritize the most important things and elevate the things that are really not very important at all. And so as life goes on, we can fall into that very easily. Make, and it makes us take the ones that we care about the most for granted. Number two, if one or both of you have been regularly undervalued, it's an indicator that the law of priority has been violated. The undervalue is when, when who they are and what they do aren't as valuable to you as something else is. And while you may feel that that's not true, because I don't think that any spouse would actually sort of say that out loud and admit it from a, a place where they aren't thinking, oh man, I'm in big trouble here. You may not feel like that's true philosophically or feel like that's true in your heart. It's the actions that matter most. If you regularly choose an activity, golf seems to always be the one that comes up when preachers talk about this subject, isn't it? Like we have so many golfers in the world. It does take a long time to play golf. Let's just, let's just point that out. Um, I'm thinking about taking up golf, by the way, Melissa. <laughs> I'm awful at it. <laughs> okay. If you regularly choose an activity of any kind of your wife, that's a problem. Ladies, if you regularly fill your free time with Long phone calls with friends and parents and whatever, and, or, or long weekend trips with little to no consideration of your husband, that's a problem. Or maybe it's smaller than that. Maybe it's like your wife is trying to talk to you and the TV's on, and you're like, shush her, because you really want to hear what this, this guy is about to say on, on, on the news channel or whatever. Man, there's a pause button, guys. <laughs> That pause button has been so key for me. They, my parents, they didn't have a pause button. They had to deal with the shushing issues, okay? We can pause it. Or maybe you're at a dinner party and your spouse is trying to say something and you sort of talk over them or, or you steal their punchline or their joke. Or like, are you, are you like tune out because you've heard that story 10,000 times? Like, this stuff matters, and if it happens regularly, then it's an indication that there's an issue with the priority, the law of priority. The truth is, is that couples today are absolutely awful at telling each other how much they mean to one another. And to compound that problem, actions really do speak louder than words. So if, if your spouse is feeling undervalued, well, I'll say your spouse feeling undervalued can become a problem in a real big hurry if you're not intentional about telling him or her how much you appreciate them and then backing that up with self-denying actions. You know, I got married 12 days after my 21st birthday. Um, so, you know, you could fill the Library of Congress with the things that I didn't know about women. And maybe... A three by five index card with the things that I did know about women. <laughs> the, the, the man and the husband that I am today uh, comes, I think, first and foremost as a result of, uh, of, you know, always being submitted to what God is doing in my heart and in my character. But it's also because I have an incredible wife who is gracious and patient and he's, she is, she's given me quite an education. <laughs> Uh, maybe not in all things women, to be clear, but I'm approaching expert level in all things Melissa Kaufman um, after 17 years. Uh, today, Melissa and I have a wonderful marriage, and we feel truly blessed by God for 
for bringing us together. I think it's important to stay real. Like we, like every other couple, have tons of room for improvement. Like that's really important for me for, to say that. We have room for improvement. We're not perfect. But I will say that because we are submitted to one another and we're submitted to God, we have every hope and expectation that our marriage is getting better with time, like a fine wine instead of sour grapes. And I think that that's a key thing for people today. I think that the general perception around marriage, maybe in the world and maybe it's leaking into the church, is that marriage usually begins good and ends bad. And I think that it's important for us as Christians. Every Christian should have the the expectation that it's getting better with time. I think it's so important for us to have that kind of hope and optimism uh, surrounding the marriage. And if that hope and optimism isn't there for you in your marriage, if you're looking forward and it brings about uh, negative feelings of anxiety or anticipation or whatever, I just want to encourage you and say that, um, you know, it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. It should be getting better with time. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, the, the marriage done God's way is, is, is only getting better. Um, I think that there are large numbers of married people uh, that, that look at the early years of their marriage as the best years. I talked to a couple a few weeks ago, and I said, when were things really the best for you? And they said it was when we were dating. So it went bad after we, started, after we got married. Things really started to struggle after that. And, um, you know, I would submit to you that maybe there's a problem, uh, a submission problem there between, like, one to another. That's usually where the issue is. Like, being submitted to the Lord is something that Christians can really get their head around. But, but being submitted to each other is usually where the issue comes into play. I would also suggest that maybe there's a faith issue, or maybe there's just a lack of understanding around how to do marriage God's way. Um, You know, I'll I'll never forget that um, it it was like we were preparing for the wedding, and uh, my father-in-law, Bob Dennis, pulled me aside, and he said, the day you get married, you're going to think you cannot possibly love her any more than you do right now. And then you're going to find out that you're wrong because love grows. It gets better and better and better. And and I found that to be true after 17 years. It does get better and better and better. Love grows. Well, Melissa and I feel very blessed uh, that we're now together. Uh, It wasn't always that way. We had some tough times. Our most difficult season of marriage to this point was when we had young children. We were both learning to be parents You might be thinking, well, your kids are pretty young. I mean like babies and toddlers, like the real hard times, very difficult times. We were both calibrating our once relatively free lives (laughs) to what parenthood should look like. Having your first child is probably the most abrupt change that your marriage is going to face. And the truth is, is that All the focus and attention is on the child, and not enough attention is put on maintaining the marriage. Uh, The only other thing that I think could possibly rival that abrupt change would be when the last child leaves the home. And as you think forward to that moment, for some of us, and some of you have already dealt with this, that is an abrupt change that has to be taken into consideration. All of your energy can't be given to your kids. You have to maintain the relationship. You're going to have kids at home. Like we have three kids. We're going to have kids at home for for 25 years. We can't abandon the marriage for the sake of the kids. We have to maintain it. And so dealing with that empty nest is something that we know is happening. Remember, parents, the overall goal of parenthood is to raise well-adjusted Christian men and women who can go out and make a life for themselves. They are going to move out, and you're going to be stuck with that other person that also lives in your house. Like, you can't avoid it forever. So abrupt change, right? So here we are, right? We're young, and we're adjusting to parenthood. And to be honest, we miscalibrated. 
I felt an insane pressure to improve our family's position financially and to do my duty as the breadwinner, the provider, so I threw myself into work in an unhealthy way. I was working for uh, basically 80 hours a week, including commute. I was away from the home for 80 hours a week, which in my opinion is way too much. And that's not an exaggeration at all. That's like I did the math and that's what we did for a long season of life. And it was destroying my marriage. It was absolutely destroying my marriage. 15 to 16 hours a day away from home, it was too much. Melissa also responds to that, and she prioritizes something else over me. She prioritized motherhood over me. I prioritized work. She prioritized motherhood. The big problem was that because of both of our personalities and our goal-oriented determination, we didn't realize that it was an issue while it was still a small issue. We, were, we thought we were you know, making sacrifices for the family, a noble thing to do, right? Well, maybe if it was done right, it would be a noble thing to do. But we did it the wrong way. We sacrificed the marriage for second-tier goals. The primary goal, the primary priority of, of life and relationship outside of God is what? It's marriage. It's your wife. It's your spouse. But second-tier goals came first. As time went on, our relationship began to cool down, and the passion for one another was all but gone. She and I both started to have unexpressed, and that's the key thing here for our story, is it was unexpressed. All this was silent. It was all quiet, unexpressed dissatisfaction with the marriage. And it was rightfully so. We had those feelings, and they were legitimate. She wasn't meeting my needs as a husband, and I wasn't meeting her needs as a wife. Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. I did that on purpose. You need a little comedic relief. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I wasn't meeting her needs as a husband, and she wasn't meeting my needs as a wife. And, um, you know, I didn't feel respected for my contribution to the household because she resented me for working so much, and she didn't feel loved in the way that she needed to feel loved because I wasn't loving her the way that she needed to be loved. It was all legitimate. And when I would go on the road driving to work, and it was a two-hour commute one way. When I, was, when I was driving to work, I would do my level best not to think about our marriage and our issues because whenever I did, whenever I couldn't avoid it, whenever I couldn't escape it, a deep-rooted sinking feeling came into the pit of my chest. And that's a hard thing to deal with whenever you're uh, a husband and, and maybe even from this perspective, more importantly, a dad. In short, that feeling came from this place. I was afraid. I was afraid because I was, having, I was starting to have feelings of regret. I was starting to wonder if Melissa and I made a mistake. I was starting to wonder if we rushed into marriage. I was starting to wonder if we would make it. And while I was having those thoughts and those feelings, she was feeling the exact same thing. Of course, I didn't know it because we didn't talk about it. I know it now. The conditions at home were cordial and cold. We behaved like teammates, fulfilling our respective roles on a team, which, to be fair, is a great part of marriage. It's a wonderful, beautiful thing, except for when that's all there is. It's an awful feeling when that's all there is. We had a friend living with us at that period of time in our lives, and the fight that should have happened way sooner got postponed because there was no time together alone to deal with it. We didn't go out on dates or do anything fun, like ever. We had small children to take care of and no money. Let me just say this. Grandparents, if you have adult children who have small kids, give your kids a break. Call them up and say, I'm getting Johnny and Sue, and I'm going to take them, and we're going we're gonna to keep them for the weekend. 
I'm getting little Johnny and I'm getting little Sue and I'm going to take them for the weekend. They're going to be ours. Y'all go do literally whatever you want. And oh, by the way, here's a hundred bucks on me. Go have a date night. All right. <laughs> we love you. Look, I'll say this. And, I, and, and I'll go into more detail about this later, I think. But a huge part of Melissa's and I's comeback story was being willing to go to our grandparents or their, the kids' grandparents and, and ask for help. The, the truth is, is that the grandparents helped constantly, all the time. But it was always for selfless reasons. It was always for ministry. It was always for church events. It was always for work-related issues. We never felt like we had the liberty to ask for something for ourselves because we thought it was selfish and it was inappropriate. Overcoming that obstacle for us was massive in our comeback story. And, and we teamed up with grandparents, and it helped in a big way. Yeah. But coming back to the struggle, we were in a season where we didn't do anything together. And even if we did have extra money, which we rarely did, we didn't want to blow it on going out to eat dinner together and have a moment together because we were so goal-oriented. We wanted to pay off our house early, pay off a 30-year mortgage in seven or eight years. That was the goal. We were doing the Dave Ramsey uh, baby steps, which is a phenomenal thing to do, right? Unless you're sacrificing your marriage in order to accomplish it. And that was something that we had to learn the hard way. And today we understand that even a small amount of investment, a financial investment into our marriage, it goes a long way. And, it, and, it, and, it's a, and that was a major miscalibration that we did early. It's become a priority for us. It, can, it really does make a difference. Now to be clear... In the most desperate times, neither one of us mentioned divorce. I know I'm, trying to, I'm kind of painting a pretty dark picture of our story, okay? But I want to do so. I want to be vulnerable because I want to touch on issues that are actually happening in your lives. This is real. Like, people struggle. Marriages struggle. And I think it's important for us to talk about that in church. And so it, was, it didn't ever go so far to where Melissa and I would talk about divorce. We didn't really fight that way. We didn't like fight in fits of rage and like start shouting at each other and saying things that we regret. We didn't fight that way. We still don't fight that way. Um, the way that our conflicts tended to arise is that from my perspective, out of the blue, after me doing nothing different at all, Melissa would erupt with tears. Due to years of unexpressed pain, because she bottles things up, or she did bottle things up, suppress it, push it down, don't deal with it now, let's deal with that another day, until it all comes to a head. And the way that I respond to that is I apologize for every single thing I can possibly think of and, and, and promise to do better and to be better just so that I can get her to stop crying because this is the main issue that's happening right now and we got to come back to the status quo. And that's the way that it would work. The problem is, is that uh, the promise to be better and to do better doesn't actually, didn't actually work for us. Didn't, I didn't actually change. The real problem was we had, a, we had a prioritization problem and we didn't realize it. Melissa was jealous of my work and the friend that I worked with for 16 hours a day who was living in our spare room, and she had every right to be. Without intentionally doing so, I had given work and maybe even my close friend her rightful spot in my relationship priority list. At the time, I would have never thought that was true. You know, philosophically, uh, uh, I would have thought, oh, well, I knew God's way for marriage, and I knew that she belonged right where I thought that she was, but the problem was is that my philosophy wasn't my reality. You can think a certain way, but do something entirely different. I wasn't, uh, 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 I was unwilling, that my reality was I was unwilling to confront my boss about the unreasonable work hours and the unreasonable commute that I did on a daily basis. 
My reality was is that I displaced my wife for work and she displaced me for the kids. That was the reality. And for the sake of time, I'm going to skip this whole section that was going to convince you that your, wife should, your, your spouse should be placed above your kids. <laughs> but if you can just take my word for that, we'll save about 10 minutes. Um, if you can take my word for that, we can do this all in about two minutes. But just kidding. Um, but I can't, I can't point to the exact moment that it happened. But God had finally completed a work in my heart. Um, and it was a massive thing. It was a life-changing completion of work that God did in my heart. I was finally convinced that the troubles in my marriage weren't a fundamental, insurmountable difference between Melissa and I. I had the important revelation that the way that I was feeling in the moment about my wife was not a concrete thing, that it could change and it could change for the better. I found out that the problem with my marriage was the person that I least expected. It was me. I had stopped being a godly husband because I placed work above my wife. And that had a, a snowball effect. It wasn't just about work above the wife. It, it, that had down, downward streaming problems to it as well. I let our issues remain unspoken for too long. I failed to treat her like the most valuable person or thing in my life. She was far more valuable to me than a paid off house, more valuable uh, uh, to me than, than work, more valuable that, to me than my position in the youth ministry that I was also doing at the time. I had forsaken my God-given responsibility to lead our marriage into godly success. Our marriage was leaderless and rudderless for uh, what turned out to be nearly five years. The only reason we managed as well as we did was because we were both raised to be committed to two key marital guardrails. The number one key, the, the, like the left side of the guardrail, would be, the, would be faith and everything that the structural institution of Christianity te teaches us. And on the other side is a key one that you can extract from the left one. The other, like the right side, is a, a biblical understanding of what covenant is. And just having those guardrails present was probably enough for us to actually bounce off against them in any real meaningful long way. Just the, their mere presence there was enough to keep us at least for the most part, headed in the right direction and not in the gutter. But the reality is, is once the Lord confronted me and once I had that revelation, once all those things became clear to me, the Lord unlocked my heart and I took action. We had an adult conversation about our marriage and communicated our needs to each other. I teamed up with grandparents, as I mentioned before, and I negotiated a one-night-a-month one thing, which they were happy to do. It was like not a big deal. I had built it up to be something more than it was, on top of all the other work-related and church-related things that they were already doing. And we took that night, and we went on dates, and we spent money, like actual dollars. Not like hundreds of dollars, but tens of dollars we spent. We even splurged and took a trip to Florida. That was a big thing for us. And it was a huge shot in the arm for our marriage. I got a different job that wasn't so demanding. I quit that job. I took a pay cut in the process. Melissa got better at voicing her dissatisfactions early while the issues were still small. And I stopped with empty promises and started with real change. That's our story, you know, and, and that's where God has brought us to a place where I have every hope and every optimism that our marriage is going to age well. And those years, those early years with young kids are hard. They are hard for everyone, even the most dedicated Christians. They are hard. 
I want to talk to the men for a moment, the husbands. If your marriage isn't going the way that it should, I want you to know that the action is on you. Leadership is your responsibility. The first step is yours to take. It may be time for you to have an adult conversation with your wife instead of letting the passive aggressiveness continue, letting the silence and coldness continue. It may be time for you to share your feelings and your fears. It may be time for you to tell her how she's not meeting your needs. It's time for you to lead your marriage and find your rudder and stop bouncing off the guardrails. Those guardrails are there for emergency situations only. It's not meant to be marriage as the status quo in life. Just grinding up against that right guardrail all the way down for 10, 15 years. That's not how it's supposed to be. It can be way better than that. Bouncing up against the covenant. Well, we can't do this because we made a covenant before God. If that's something that regularly comes into your mind, that's an indication of a real problem. We can't do, we, you know, we can't uh, separate because we set a vow before God. Like that. That's so far off on the guardrail. It's not normal operation. Leadership is your responsibility. Ladies, the response is your responsibility. The husband might set the course, but you're going to determine how it goes based on your response to his leadership. And that's so key. It's so important. He needs to be supported in his leadership efforts. If you undercut him in his leadership efforts, you might not get another attempt. That response is so key. It actually reminds me of one of our core values here. It's actually the core value for worship. Jesus showed leadership by making the first step to calm down in the flesh and make provision and, and, and bring, uh, bring the right sacrifice for our sins, right, when he died on the cross. One of our core values here at the church is that his love and grace requires a response from us. So we sort of embody the bride of Christ in how we respond to what his leadership has done in our lives. Ladies, that's what you're doing as the wife when he takes leadership. If your marriage is in this dysfunctional, cyclical pattern of hot to cold and then cold to hot again and, and from close to near and then near to far again, only to be separated by those outbursts of tears in a matter of time, I, wanna know, I want you to know there's a better way. More than likely, you have a priority uh, problem. Determine what you've placed in your spouse's rightful position and push it down to where it goes. And give your husband a promotion. Give your wife a promotion in your life. It's not complicated. <laughs> it's really not that hard. It's simple to understand. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. I'm going to thank you for the extra time you've allowed me this morning. But Amen. as we end, I want to talk about three things that will be really quick. The three things that, com that comes up when we talk about priorities. And I've been alluding to this idea of a priority list for this whole message. And I want to just kind of flesh that out just a little bit for you. I want you to do three things. The first thing is I want you to actually make a priority list. And while your list might be more detailed, more specific, I think generally, for the most part, a Christian couple's priority list looks generally the same. And it looks like number one priority for the couple is your relationship to God. Number two is your spouse. Number three after that, and we saved 10 minutes by not talking about this, but I promise it was good, is, is, is your kids. Kids come after your spouse. Number four, I think, is church. Number five is work. Number six, friends. Number seven, hobbies and interests. So that's the first thing. Just take a, a, a kind of a detailed list, and yours will look maybe a little bit different than that, but generally the structure should be about the same. And then second... It's important for you to prove these priorities in a real way. 
Don't make the same mistake as me and have the right philosophy but the wrong practice. It's so easy to do. I can attest to that. You can think that you know how things should go, but then not really do a very good job at evaluating yourself at doing it. Prove these priorities in real ways. And third and finally, prepare to protect these priorities for the rest of your life. Like I said in the beginning, life has an uncanny ability to disrupt the law of priority. We need to maintain our heart's position towards our spouse. The good news is that that maintenance should be fun. It is fun. It looks like weekend getaways and date nights. And it it looks like attending marriage conferences or talking to a spiritual uh, advisor, talking to a spiritual mentor or a counselor. You don't have to wait until things are on the rails to talk to somebody. Like it can be just regular maintenance. It can just be a part of your marriage that you're willing to talk to people and be real. You'll probably end up helping your counselor more than you realize. Like it, it's, this stuff is good. It's good to be open and honest and vulnerable. Amen. If y'all stand with me as we end, I invite Melissa to come forward and, and pray us out. But here in a minute, we're going to have an opportunity for you to receive prayer for anything you might need prayer for. Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with marriage at all, but we come to church and it's okay to pray. So I just want to invite Melissa to end us. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for every marriage in this place, Lord, every couple. Lord, and I ask as we go about this week, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to put you first, but to put our spouse, Lord, second. Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, where we have placed other things ahead of um, our spouse. Lord, that you would help us, Lord, to, to speak and to communicate, Lord God, that you would cause us to be bold, Lord, in our conversations, but God, that you would be in the middle of it all, Lord God. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you bless every marriage here, Lord, every couple. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that, that what you have put together, that no man can pull it apart, Lord God. And so, Lord, I thank you for strong marriages in this place, and we just honor you with our lives and honor you in our marriages. In Jesus' name, amen.